Um, what we're going to be looking, uh, going to look at today, uh, why we want to extend the normal regression model, uh, why we should use categorical variables, uh, how to deal with interaction terms, uh, model accuracy, and comparison. Out of those, probably the most useful stuff is going to be the model accuracy and comparison. That's going to be the most useful stuff, I think, going forward when you're actually doing statistical modeling. Uh, right, but I'm saving that good stuff till the end. Um, okay, so uh, why would we want to extend the normal regression model? So we've used numerical variables uh, so far, and those are useful, but in the real world, uh, you will have to work with categorical variables. There is no way around this. Uh, basically, if you get practically any data set, um, you will have uh, categorical uh, variables. Um, and yeah, it'll be fine. So basically, for instance, if you're going to uh, analyze football data, you'll want to look at teams. That's a categorical variable. Um, if you're looking at voting data or something like that, you might want to look at it by political party, another categorical uh, variable. Uh, if you're looking at disease spread, and let's face it, people have been looking at disease spread over the last couple of years, um, you know, you're going to be looking at infected and not infected. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of categor uh, categorical variables out there. Um, you know, you're all intelligent people. I'm sure you can think of lots of them. So just off the top of my head, if you're looking at something like road transport, uh, you might be looking at all the vehicles coming along. You might want to categorize them into cars and lorries because those might have different effects if you're looking at the pollution. You know, if you have a great big 30 ton lorry, 38 ton lorry, uh, and a small little electric car, uh, they're going to be a little bit different there. Uh, right. Okay. So the next one is utilizing a categorical predictor. So in the first example in this chapter, we're presented with temperature data taken at 9 a.m and 3 p.m. Uh, this temperature data is purely numerical. So where does the categorical element come in? It doesn't actually come in um, with the temperatures. Um, the categories, uh, in this case, are based on the location of where the temperatures are measured. And they are quite different. So they're both in Australia. Uh, the temperatures were measured in two locations. Uh, so Uluru and Wollongong. And you might not know where those are, um, that's fine. I found them because I put, I, I put it into the internet and look at there, there they are. So oh. Uluru is right in the middle. And uh, yeah, I think it used to be known as, I think that's what used to be known as Ayers Rock. It's kind of like right in the outback. So it's basically Australian desert. Um, Wollongong, I don't actually know, never been to Australia, but it's by the seaside. So you're going to have some um, see there. So um, do you think the location where the measurements were taken is going to impact the temperature reading? We might have some data to support your view on this or contradict it, depending on what your view is. Right. OK, so there we go. Uh, when you go through the code in there, uh, you'll see that there's 100 uh, data points for Uluru and 100 for Wollongong. Uh, when it comes up with a tibble, which is basically a new kind of data frame, it comes up with this like weird stuff like FCT and uh, INT. Um, if you don't know what these are, they're fine. Basically, that FCT stands for factor, uh, which is a bit like a categorical variable. They're relatively interchangeable. Integer is basically a whole number. Uh, but don't worry about that too much. Okay, so this, date, this um, graph down here, gets a little bit of ahead of ourselves. But um, what's being modeled here is location as a categorical predictor variable. So we're able to model the temperature 3 p.m. So that's what we're interested in by location. Uh, and that's what you get. So by the seaside, it's generally going to be quite a bit cooler um, than Uluru in the outback. So yeah, there is a fair temperature difference between the two. Um, so, right, let's get on to the next one. And, and at 45, the, the thermometer is burning. Yeah. 
It doesn't yeah. it doesn't show any kind of data. It's dead. <laughs> well, we, we we practically got up to. We, I mean, this data might be a little bit old now. We 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 almost I think we did get up to about forty recently in the UK. So it's probably forty five in Australia by now. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're all burning. Uh, right. Okay. So um, this actually goes back a little bit. Um, this is the uh, so the stand bit. That's the Bayesian bit, and the GLM is the generalized linear model. So basically, with all this, you will notice a pattern. Temp 3 p.m., that's the dependent variable that we're interested in. That's what we're trying to predict. And then you have a little tilde, a little, little um, swervy sign. And what's it, uh, what is being used to predict the 3 p.m. here is just the temperature at 9 p.m. there. So um, there's some prior information there. But it's a relatively no going forward. Oh, no. Go back. Go back. There we go. Yeah. So it's a, that is a, uh, the simplest model that we're going to come up with today, and it does all of that. Uh, generates some information, and you'll recognise the little furry caterpillars and those there. Um, to be honest, with all of these models, so there are four models today. They all all the information there looks pretty similar uh, but yeah let's get on to the next one uh, so this one um, can this, I, can I yeah. um, uh, ask her something so yeah. basically we are now just uh, on the previous model so yeah. we, we are predicting uh, temperature uh, 3 p.m based yeah. on temperature at 9 p.m yeah okay. oh, sorry, and, 9 a.m night sorry 9 a.m did yeah. I say PM? I probably did say, yeah. Hi, Eric. But, uh, it's, yeah, it's definitely morning temperature is being used okay. to predict afternoon temperature. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yes. Right. Calm down. Yes, it'll be fine. Um, yeah. uh, right. Okay. So, model two, um, as you can see, if, if you're playing around with these things, it's virtually completely stayed, stayed the same. All that's changed is you've removed the temperature at 9 a.m. and put in location. So it's it's quite easy to change. Uh, Family is still Gaussian? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, yeah. Uh, and I'm sure there's anything at the bottom of this. Oh, look. oh no, yeah, some more fairy cast pillars. Like I say, I mean, um, these ones, the peaks are slightly different, change, but there's not. I I personally can't see a big difference there. So there are some differences between the models, but they're not readily apparent in uh, in those visualizations there. Um, so this is actually going back a little bit. Uh, this is the temperature at three p.m. This is the temperature at 9 a.m. And this is the data uh, points. Now, you might want to take a guess about which one's Uluru, which one's um, Wollongong. Uh, but if you just looked at that, you could probably fit a pretty nice regression line along it. You know, they're not that different. Um, yes, but uh, we, we're going to see in a second uh, what what they actually look like with uh, the categorical variables um, using them as the oh there we go yeah basically so that they fit two regression lines here uh, and actually those work really rather quite well uh, so Wollongong here it's all pretty close to Wollongong um, Uluru. There's a couple of the Uluru ones uh, that are on the Wollongong side. And I think there's one Wollongong one yeah. over there on the Uluru, Uluru side. But really, if you're going to be predicting this, putting those two regression lines in, great predictions, basically. that you know Those are pretty close. Uh, so if I was in the real world and not using a textbook example, I'd be pretty happy with that. Um, right. Um, yeah, if, we, if we haven't uh, take that into account, the, the slope will be like uh, way different, I assume. Like if we didn't take 
uh, into account like the two location yeah. we definitely have a different slope yeah we like yeah the there slope would, will be probably there, higher yeah the, 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 there would be a different slope i don't think it yeah. would be incredibly different uh, but i just think it yeah it is a better model using the categorical predictors there which i think is the point in the book basically you know that, that that's what they want us to get um so yeah they've, they've given us the data to, uh, to prove that thing uh right okay so here now now we're getting super advanced basically model three so uh basically all the bottom stuff there it's all the same uh still predicting temperature at 3 p.m uh this time though we're using temperature at 9 a.m and location because basically we can do that uh, and actually that's not a big number of predictive variables really that um you know there'll be lots of models out there that use a lot more um but for us that's that's going some because it's using um a numerical variable and a categorical one there in the same model uh but yeah basically that's all fine and all goes down there I don't know why I didn't come up with the furry animals uh, for this one. No fuzzy moustache for us. No, no fuzzy moustache. <laughs> um, right. Okay. Um, for some reason, it said it was optional, uh, the interaction terms. It shouldn't be optional, basically. Interaction terms are relatively important. You will see lots of interactions amongst variables when you're doing modeling. Um, so. Humidity. In this data set, there's actually some more variables, including quite right, as you spotted, Olivia, uh, humidity at 9 a.m. Now, this actually affects them differently. So uh, in Uluru, uh, where there's increasing humidity, the temperature is generally lower. That's, that's quite a substantial effect. In Wollongong, it's the opposite, except the, the effect size isn't quite so big, basically. Yeah. Uh, so the relationship between uh, 3 p.m. temperature and 9 a.m. humidity varies by location. Um, so, or more technically, we say that location and humidity predictors interact. Mm. Uh, right. Okay, so do you need an interaction term? Uh, just because you can have an interaction term in a model doesn't mean that you have to include it. What factors you should consider when deciding whether to include them? Uh, so the first one is context. Does it make sense? Uh, if it doesn't make sense, don't worry about it, leave it out. Uh, visualizations. When you've been doing exploratory data analysis, having a look at your data, um, is it obvious that the interaction has a significant impact? If it does have a significant impact, um, put it in. Um, this tickled me actually, because this entire book is a Bayesian book. And one of the things that they put here in, in uh, the interaction term is hypothesis tests. Um, so not that we're actually gonna be doing hypothesis tests because we're all doing like Bayesian stuff. I mean, not that there's only going against, but mainly we're gonna be doing uh, Bayesian stuff. But if, if we decided to go and do a t-test or something or whatever, um, if there is proper evidence from them that the interaction is significantly different from zero, so you can reject the null hypothesis, um, as the uh, frequentists would say, then it makes sense to include it, basically. So if, if a frequentist tells you that um, they can reject the null hypothesis with this interaction term, uh, then you might want to include the interaction term. Uh, right. Okay, so uh, basically dreaming bigger, using more than two predictors. So, you know, we're, we're going wild here. Um, it's not like we've got a data set with hundreds. Uh, what are we up to? About six. Um, so, yeah, we, we, haven't, we haven't got tons here, but we've got a few more. We've got wind speed, we've got humidity, we've got pressure, uh, as well as location and temperature. Um, okay, now... This is where it goes completely wild. 
because this is weather model four. Uh, so again, uh, it's quite simple. All of the stuff. Oh, everything. We take everything. everything. Yeah. yeah. So all you do, all you do to include everything is you put your little tilde in, the little swirly swirl bit, and a dot, and it puts everything in. Yeah. That, that way, like before, it wasn't interaction, it was just a plus, no, in the formula. Yeah. yeah. So it's not no interaction, yeah, OK. Yeah. Just making sure, sure, perfect, yeah. sorry. Um, and yeah. Now, one of the questions which may help you understand stuff later is, does shucking all of that extra information in help the model or not, basically? Uh, I just want to check if there's something down here. Boop, boop. Uh, the moustache, yeah. the moustache. Uh, fuzzy moustache. Yeah. See, there's not a lot of difference, is there, really, between no. one, two, three, and four? Um, that, that, that just means like the simulation run well, but that doesn't show like the yeah. prediction. Yeah. Um, so, posterior summaries. So, we can now pick through the posterior simulation results for our seven model parameters, here simplified to their corresponding 95% credible intervals. So, um, with this, some of these predictors aren't really going to help you predict that much. Uh, some of them are. So, for in instance, if the location is Wollongong, uh, there's a pretty significant effect uh, that the temperature is going to be reduced because uh, they're both minus there. Uh, wind speed, it's basically a little bit plus to a little bit minus. It's not going to have a massive effect. Um, humidity, um, now this is important to bear in mind because of the interaction effect. Overall, uh, what it's saying is it's going to reduce. Yeah. Um, but we know that that's only true really uh, for the Uluru site. Wollongong is a little bit different, but the overall, um, because the effect in Uluru was bigger, that kind of dominates overall. Um, pressure at 9 a.m. doesn't make much of a difference. Temperature at 9 a.m. does make a, a bit of difference. To be honest, I'm not really sure what sigma is. I think that's the error term, isn't it? Uh, but yeah, that does have some effect. And uh, what sigma is? Oh, sigma is the... I think it's the error term. Uh, oh, the variation of the temperature? No. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Standard um, deviation, right? OK. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah. And th this, I, this, I think, is quite common to other data sets that I've looked at. Not all of your variables will be massively influential uh, on the outcome. Uh, so you might want to think whether you actually need to keep them. So the dot formula, like when you do a formula, like uh, like you have done like something like that. Let yeah. me write it, it could be easier. Like it was dump and 3 a.m. or 3 p.m. I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, simulation, that's something. It's, uh, it's more or less equal to like temp uh, 3 p.m. I will just do it once. Yeah. Uh, equal, let's say, humidity time uh, with a multiply with everything. Wind, time, pressure. So we have an interaction on everything, or it's just adding, just to be clear. Like um, something like that? Or. Well, uh, I, think they were, I think they were just pluses. Oh, I pluses, think, no yeah. interaction. So. Okay, yeah. I, I think I think in this model what they would because um, they said in the text that the interaction was optional. Um, okay, but I remember from doing my undergrads, interactions were quite important. But I think in 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 this one that they would have been pluses rather than times is. Um, yeah. So it's nice. the the plus 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 option. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. And. Right, so model evaluation and comparison. Uh, this is where it kind of like uh, gets interesting. So we've, we've got the f uh, four models here. Uh, so yeah, the first one is the numerical one. The second one is the categorical one. Third is numerical and categorical. And fourth, 
chuck ev chuck yeah chuck everything in basically uh right so how should they be compared Where's the going forward? Uh, oh, hold on there we go right um so rather helpfully in the text what it says there is uh how fair is each model and basically they said it's all the same data collected at the same point uh so they're all equally fair it's probably something to bear in mind when you're just working with your own data uh have they actually been um ascertained on the same kind of basis uh so the second point how wrong is each model now this is a very statistician thing to say not how right is each model but how wrong is each model um so uh visual posterior predictive checks and i'll show you that in a second uh, but that's in figure 11.17 suggest that the assumed structures underlying weather model three uh, and weather model four better capture the bimodality in temporary pm thus models are less wrong than weather model one and weather model two uh, so they're only less wrong they're not right they're just less wrong uh, so how accurate each model's weather predictions. Uh, we'll address this question below using three approaches we learned in chapter 10. So visualization, cross-validation, and if I can remember it correctly, expected log predictive density, ELPD, I think. We'll find out in a second. Uh, right. So yeah, this was the um, section two, posterior predictive checks. So left to right, uh, models one to four, there's not vast amounts of difference between all of them, really. Uh, but three and four are a bit better. So th there's a bit more space um, at the top there in one and two than there are in three and four. Uh, but, you know, they don't look terrible for any of them. Uh, right. Okay, so... Uh, this is 11.18, so posterior predictive models of 3 p.m. temperature uh, corresponding to uh, weather model 1 and weather model 2. In both uh, plots, the dark dots represent the observed 3 p.m. temperatures. Uh, I think that's a violin plot on the right. Um, so you see, they're not terrible, really. I mean, most of the stuff is in, the, I think it's the 95% credible interval on the left-hand side one most of it's in there so they're not terrible models uh, by any means uh, this is model three um, now model three it's actually a bit more accurate i think on wollongong than uluru because uh, the ones that are outside it on wollongong are really quite close but particularly there's one on the bottom there in uluru which is a fair bit away uh, right. Now, we might come up to a problem here, uh, because the last one uh, is where it all goes wrong, basically. Uh, model four, we can't really visualize the data because it's, uh, it's, got, it's got too high dimensions. There's too many variables in it, basically. So there's not a nice um, data visualization that we can use. I'm sure that that would be a brilliant PhD project for someone to do a um, good data visualization on high dimensional data. Um, but um, there are other methods that we can use instead. Uh, right. Okay. I actually disagreed with the text a little uh, when it came to the cross validation, because it gives all sorts of arguments about why you might want to choose model one and model two and model four. Um, but basically, the right answer here is model three is the most accurate. Um, now, there's not vast amount of differences between three and four, but it's model three that is the most accurate uh, on there. Uh, Ever seen? Yeah. Um, Every matrix? Yeah. Hmm. Now, expected log predicted densities. Uh, don't provide interpretal metrics for the posterior predictive accuracy of any single model, uh, but they are useful for comparing posterior predictive accuracy of multiple models. 
So this is such a statistician's um, uh, tool, really. You know, it doesn't make sense to any normal person, but for statistician, it can be useful. So uh, ELPD uh, uh, model comparisons are consistent with our conclusions based upon the tenfold uh, cross-validation comparisons. M uh, mainly, uh, weather model one outperforms weather model two, and uh, weather model three outperforms both of them. Further, the distinction between weather model three and weather model, sorry, weather model four is crowded. Now, the, one of the reasons that I prefer three to four is it's actually a more simple model. Because if you remember with four, you basically chucked everything in it. So I think it's better to keep it simple um, because it comes down to the uh, bias variance um, trade-off, basically, um, which, which we'll uh, see in a second. But there's not a big difference between three and four. Three is the more simple one, so you use that one, basically. Isn't it also like, isn't model four like have a risk of overfitting? Yeah, because yeah. Like that, if that. We check everything. If we that if we, I mean, if we check like for example like some, uh, I'm, maybe it come letters, but I assume like if we if we remove some data and check like I don't know the frequentist method will be a bootstrap bootstrap. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it exists in Bayesian framework, but if you bootstrap it, mm -hmm. it will give you like maybe different results yeah uh, the, I don't know. The, there's a um quite a lot of research um particularly about frequentist statistics that you get a lot of false positives basically um if you talk to the data enough you can you can you can prove what you want to basically uh, yeah uh right okay so yeah next bit is uh bias variance trade-off so um, overly simple models with few or no predictors tend to have high bias but low variability. So this is the stuff on the left. Um, so yeah, nice simple model, not that accurate. Overcomplicated models with lots of predictors, basically the chuck everything into your model and hope for the best brigade, um, no. tend to have low bias but high variability. Um, so yeah, that's basically the overfitting. Um, and you, you'll get different sort of result when you go and um, if you divide it between um, your, your, your training data uh, and your, your actual data that you want to test, if you, if you overfit it, they'll be quite different. What you want is something down the middle. So it's basically a balance on there. Uh, right. So there's not much more to go, but we'll keep going. Uh, right, so yeah. Uh, so, what have we just done? We've done multivariable Bayesian, Bayesian normal linear regression. Um, we found that categorical variables can improve the model, uh, but there's no free lunch. Include too many variables and the model will become overfitted. Uh, model building is a balancing act, but uh, so just remember the bias variance trade off, basically. Um, you can take your time with model building. There's no 100% right answer. Uh, also, like, I don't know what, like, in, the, in this simple case, like we studied, like, I think you have one, one location, which is like in some arid places, very arid places. And the other one is like uh, also uh, in like some probably coastal humid, uh, temperate, very temperate humid climates. And if you take into account location, you basically take into account humidities or wines because this this yeah. value are correlated. Yeah, the location yeah. is correlated with a lot uh, of other parameters. So it's 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 a long time since I've been in an undergraduate stats class, but I think they used to call it multi collinearity. So basically, yeah, uh, it's it's where where you get great big loads of variables and a lot of them are really interrelated, and it it, it does mess it up. Basically, so you yeah. want to you want to keep your models relatively simple, so uh, to reduce the multicollinearity. Yeah, I think uh, this is sometimes a part of what people call data leakage. 
when you have like you inject data that produces the same results in the same way. But I'm unsure yeah. this is like mm. if it's true. Um, well, but I yeah, was it? I don't think it was an awful one. No, yeah, for some reason, it's, it's yeah, one more. No, I, I don't think I do actually. I think that was it. Yes. I, I, yeah. I, I, I I tell you, at 12 yeah. o'clock today, I didn't think I would get there. I thought I was going to have a nervous breakdown when I've been the previous one. Um, so, uh, I have I, to learn how to do this emoji. Uh, I, I don't know. Do, 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 you, do you know um, uh, Great British <laughs> Bake Off? Do, is yeah, I think... We, I think we need, like, to quarter, we will need, like, a, a special book club on it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I might have a go. You know, I might have a go at quarter over the weekend when I'm less stressed. I don't think the stress helps. But yeah, no, there was there was an episode of the Great British Bake Off where they had they were all in this tent, and one guy got his cake wrong, and he and he famously chucked it in the bin, uh, and, and walked off. Uh, but fortunately, I may have been in that position, but uh, I wasn't on camera, so I could come back and do do a different cake as well in the afternoon. So yeah, it turned out right in the end. Yeah, it's good to take risks also. Congra congratulations of taking risks and trying. I mean, yeah. challenging yourself is good too. So good job. <laughs> well, it was good. Yeah, um, I meant to say that we tomorrow start. Um, we are, tomorrow we are starting a new uh, court for so the, the first court actually for the fisher engineering uh, and selection. Whoa! Yeah. Ooh. So it's a five p.m. UTC. So if you want to join, that would be nice. <laughs> so we we yeah. talk about fisher engineering, about like modifying predictors, adding it, predictors to. Is Is that the Max Kuhn one? Is he yeah. one of the authors on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, stick the link in the chat when it always. It's, uh, I'll have a look at that. Yeah. Um, uh, that's it. Yeah. I, I will. I will probably like wait a bit before doing other book club. Um, but I will. I will try to advocate for one because like it's advertising from a Paula Morega about air in law, like, which I will probably doing one with air in law, which is a Bayesian stuff, but without MCMC. Uh, well. Um, oh. this this is the only book club that I do. I mean, I'm sure all of the other ones wouldn't be as good. No, no. Currently, just one, and maybe another one. But that's it. that's it. Two is yeah, just one at the moment. I'm doing advanced art as well. Yeah. Oh, so that's just three. Yeah. So the good. Uh, I, I'm I meant to do a package and the JavaScript, but um, I cannot do it so too much. Otherwise, I've done. And don't do. I, I haven't got time to do all this. But no, I, I, think think I plan to do that. The one on um, on engineering, not the one like feature, but just a classic engineering. Like there is one. Like let me check it. Look at good also. Like um, let me check. Uh, do 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 for data science. Uh, the do for data science, which apparently just uh, I will I will post the link, which will which will start soon. But yeah, this one looks good too. But at one point you have to you have to to stop. Just focus on on few. I think. Where where do you get the link? For the book club, I'm trying to get it on the on the the chat. It was on the uh, Anans. Uh, Do for uh, data science. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to find it. It's uh, oh, let, let me go here. Book for data science. I have to join the channel first, and then maybe after I can pass you the link. But I think this one is good. It oh, let me. But I, I have no time, so maybe I watch video. But like. It's DevOps, yes. Okay, so this was like. Oh yeah, DevOps, yeah. 
I'm not exactly yeah. sure what DevOps are. It's some kind of programming thing, isn't it? <laughs> it's uh, that um, the the government uh, in the UK runs these short uh, courses, like uh, for getting people into work and stuff like that. Um, and I think they're like about 13 weeks. And I think DevOps is one of them, basically. So oh. yeah, they, they, they get like online tuition for 13 weeks and then that's where you can get DevOps. That's so it's, it's trendy. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I, I will, I will like wait a bit. In, so like we are, I think I still have to do some exercise in this book because before feeling a bit more confident so i'm reading chapter but i'm not doing exercise so it's kind of bad but uh yeah yeah learning uh, takes time anyway yeah. so you uh, need to I, you grab the things that you need to elaborate and then you know yeah. able to uh, i really like I like, your, I like uh, some exercise sorry I, I don't know if you have tried them frederica in uh, advanced air yeah, uh, so I'm learning. It, uh, yeah. There's a few things that for me are quite far, far away in the space. I don't know. But uh, it's interesting. Uh, so, you know, there's uh, little things that are useful to know that you might don't, don't think about. And others that are more complicated. And those ones takes like time and uh, practice so if you use them uh, otherwise stay there yeah no, it, 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 I, I just like yeah i understand like not doing sometimes but like i really like uh like I'm, I'm 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 starting to read like his book about mastering shiny because i'm terrible at shiny and i want to understand it and the, his exercises are very great design like uh i'm like shocked like okay oh, is, is super great teachers uh, with the exercise. Because like every time I do, I think I understand something, I do the exercise and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. Mastering Shine is a, a very good book. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm very bad at this. <laughs> the, the, th the thing that puts me off about Shiny uh, is Power BI. Because I'm slightly worried that like Power BI will become like the new Excel or something like that. And everyone will just like use it by default. And then people won't use Shiny. But I mean, I, 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 I like R. I mean, I just, yeah. yeah, I mean, like R more than Python or anything like that. Yeah. No, yeah, I don't know. I'm not doing Shiny to do like good presentation or website. I'm doing it mostly because sometimes, you know, like for example, when you want to compare stuff, like I'll go ahead, let's say like you have some, you want to compare like various way of doing something. Uh, it's, uh, and you don't want to, you can just like uh, use it like to compare various methods and see the result with Shiny. And sometimes it's better to share uh, with coworker. So I like uh, my Shiny app are crappy. Like they are totally awful, but just do the job like for like, okay, I want to try that. And people does, don't want to check the code. They just want to see the results of, and I think at my level, it's enough, but for me, I'm not like, <laughs> must. but yeah, just doing exercise are good for us, or at least for me. <laughs> well, it's, I think people say about R is that it's not really used in production and stuff like that. And it's, it's more kind of like Python and stuff like that. But I mean, I don't really do. I don't really put stuff into production. I'm more like a hobbyist who kind of like will look at data and stuff like that. Um, so I mean, I like R. Um, I don't know. I don't. I'm not like uh, enough competent. But every time I use R, like on remote servers, I just use. Uh, I can just use a, a script that take value and run it with a shell script. It works. Like <laughs> it's probably not good, not scalable, or whatever. I don't know. Uh, I'm not competent enough. But for my needs, it works. Hmm. Because when I originally started like doing data analysis uh, at uni, we used something called SPSS. And I don't think anyone yeah. uses that anymore. I, I learned it at school. I forget yeah. it happily. Yeah. <laughs> Let me, uh, I think. Yeah, that's why DevOps, I think DevOps is all of that. 
Uh, so maybe it's help, but uh, I don't know. I think, uh, yeah. well, so next week it's Brenda, no? You ready? Or, or is Connecticut? I thought it was me next week, isn't it? Maybe the last one. Why? Too much work? Uh, join the other one. Join the uh, wait and when join the other court. I'm advertising for other, I'm bad. <laughs> okay. He'll well, be having he'll be having too much fun, uh, fun at Freshers Week by, by the sounds of it. We are cooler than them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, okay, I will have to go. And yeah. uh, it was thanks for the presentation. Uh, it was good. I haven't read the the. I couldn't have find time to uh, to read the chapter, but I think. I understand it well, thanks to your, your job. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Good. Good stuff. See you next week. Yeah, thanks. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.